So this is the Wards 1 and 8 uh, Neighborhood Planning Assembly, or NPA meeting. Uh, welcome, everyone. Good, great to see you. At any point, if you're hungry, feel free to take uh, advantage of the food up here. I believe it's all vegetarian, Karen. Is that right? No. Nope. There are beef samosas in one place and veggie samosas in the other. There's two okay. Yeah, so um, please enjoy. And we're gonna jump right into this because uh, um, we're lucky to have the, the new president of the University of Vermont. Mm -hmm. Um, I'll speak up. So, Suresh Garamella, is that how you pronounce? Perfect. Yeah. Perfect. Um, I'm going to just jump in and have you speak because I know you have a limited amount of time this evening. Uh, so you'll be, he'll be making some remarks and then there'll be time for Q&A. I ask that the Q&A be uh, fairly succinct questions. If there are longer questions, then we can set up time for more in-depth conversation at another point. But um, just want to be able to get answer any informational questions you have for Suresh uh, uh, this evening. And then after that, we'll go into introductions. Um, we'll have a, a little bit of uh, business. Um, we'll have speak out of the opportunity to make announcements and raise concerns. Uh, somebody from, from Burlington Electric Department will be here. Uh, we'll talk about uh, water resources issues and the city councilors will speak. So it's a packed evening. Uh, but we'll jump in now to uh, comments from the new president. So welcome. Thank you. Um, not sure if I should speak into this thing or? Yes, please. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much, Cindy, and thanks for all, to all of you for giving me this opportunity. Uh, I'm the new guy, so I'll uh, defer to my wonderful team here who uh, have much more experience in all this than I do. Um, thank you for welcoming us to the community. We've uh, really, we really feel like a part of the community already. Um, we came here around June and uh, sometime later June. Uh, we have two children. They came with us, but they went back to college. They come back for holidays and such. They'll be here for Thanksgiving and so on. So um, enjoyed what Burlington has to offer so far and, and, the, and Vermont has to offer. We hope to do more of that. Um, just a few comments. I've um, tried to do my best to learn about um, UVM and its place in the state, its place in the county, its place in the city, its place in the ward. <laughs> so um, what I've gleaned, I guess, is that, um, uh, hello, Annie, Annie's here. So I feel now protected. Um, so, so uh, you know, I think that, um, I, I said this during my installation that, you know, what's good for UVM or what's good for the state is good for UVM, et cetera. And I feel obviously the same about our community, um, we have to find a way to coexist and, and benefit from each other. And, and I'm, I'm sure you're all proud of having UVM here and recognize the, the great value it brings for the intellectual capital, the social capital, the economic capital of the, of the region. Uh, but of course, you know, with, with, um, with students and with the university and such come, come challenges as well. And so, um, you know, I, I think that you know these numbers uh, and, and the facts a lot better than I do, but my, uh, my understanding is that UVM has been a very strong economic engine for the region, for the state, and, uh, and um, you know, I'm, I'm quite proud that a good number of students that come to UVM stay in the state, so it's certainly a source of brain gain. The numbers, if, if you've not heard them recently, are that about 68% of, of Vermont state students that come to UVM stay in the state, and about 31% of those that come from outside the state stay in the state. So clearly, we add to the workforce, we add to the vitality of the state. Um, 
I, you know, there's the whole entrepreneurship thing. Um, Adam Roof is here. We were at this BTV Ignite thing, and we talked about the great um, sort of commercialization uh, and the startups and such that we've together worked on with VSET and BTV Ignite, et cetera. Um, there's, you know, we're the second largest employer, so even just in terms of people, faculty, staff, students, some of whom are back there. Um, you know, obviously we have a big presence here. Uh, I, I understand, I, I, would be, I would be completely blind and deaf to not know that housing and transportation and, um, and sort of quality of life issues uh, in the neighborhoods are uh, all issues that you've all been grappling with. You know, I've lived in university towns a lot of the last, uh, I don't know, 35, 40 years, maybe 40 years. And some of the challenges are somewhat similar in other places too. Um, it seems like we do a fairly reasonable job of communicating and such. Um, so I, I thought you should know, hear from me directly, that my priorities for UVM, for my presidency, are the students, um, their success, their uh, experience while they're here, um, that we, we help them be successful after they graduate, hopefully in the state, but other places as well. Um, I think the affordability of a UVM education is also very important to me. I don't think we can price ourselves out of the market. We'll do all we can to keep the, the cost of education um, modest. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm quite proud that 44% of, uh, of Vermonters attend the university tuition free without paying tuition. Um, we should do more, we can do more. Uh, we put a good amount of money into um, like 160 million or so into student support, uh, scholarships and things like that. Um, so, you know, student success, uh, if, if we're not focused on that, we wouldn't be a university. Uh, and then the other piece of it is that one of the reasons I came to UVM is that it's a land grant, it's a public land grant university. Um, I'm very proud that Senator Morrill, Justin Morrill, is from, is a Vermonter. He wrote that uh, legislation that uh, uh, President Lincoln signed. And what it means, what a land grant institution means to me is that uh, a, a, an institution like UVM is here to bring our assets to bear on the community. There's a lot of richness um, to, to what UVM does and, and brings, and we will do all we can to have it be uh, uh, supporting the community and the state, the region, et cetera. So those are really the, the fundamental priorities. Many things derive from there. And so, uh, you know, we've had some good successes just recently, even since I came. We had a large grant that we announced um, to, for opioid treatment. Of course, you know, the whole state's suffering from that. The whole region is, the whole country is. But Burlington's um, treatment efforts are certainly assisted by that. Um, and so, uh, you know, again, I think that this quality of life issue is an ongoing uh, conversation that we must continue to have. I think there's been a fair amount of collaboration. Joe and Gus and others, uh, Lisa, uh, certainly have continued that conversation. Um, I, 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 in terms of housing, which of course has come up many times in my conversations already, uh, you know, we house 63% of our students on campus. Um, which is a lot higher than most of our peers do, which is, which, which is a good thing. Um, we house, we require the first two years of, of students, the first and second year students to stay on campus, which is fairly atypical. Typically, it's only the first year students um, that, are, um, that are required to stay. So I think, I think we're doing some things. We've added 875 beds on campus in the last 10 years, which actually exceeds the number of the, the increase in students. Um, so I think that um, you all, you probably know that we've uh, been engaged in a study of housing. We have a consultant helping us, and um, together we're looking at so the, uh, the, the needs of our undergrad students, our graduate students, our medical students, et cetera. Um, and so we should have that report fairly soon, and as soon as we do, I'd like to have the consultant come in, but perhaps make a presentation to this group um, so that you see what he has um, come up with and from what he's uh, learned from the students. And um, so uh, again, I think this 
whether to house them on campus, off campus. Again, if we were able to provide desirable housing on campus, um, I think some more of our students could stay. But it's basically up to our, you know, we hear that our juniors and seniors want to stay in the city, and uh, certainly our graduate students often do. So, you know, we can only, we can't force students to, 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 to stay somewhere. So, um, so I think it's a, it's, a, it's a nice, it's a gentle balance between what we can offer, how we can um, nudge that problem uh, or the, the, the issue, and how we work with all of you to address it too. So, um, you know, basically, I think you have my commitment that my team and I and others uh, will work with the city um, and, and the wards as uh, closely as we can, and um, I'm certainly trying my best to learn more, and that's, this is one of those opportunities for me. So today, happy to answer questions. Um, most of them I may have to defer to Joe and Gus and Lisa and others, just for the details, but you will also hear from me. So, uh, Joe, anything else I no, should be great. saying? That's okay, great. great. Thank you, Cindy, that was, is that, okay. Yes. Is that okay? Yeah, oh, thanks. thank you. Mm -hmm. So, y yes? Yeah, so what I want to do is uh, first get the mic turned on. Is it on now? Yeah. Can you hear it? Tom? Can you hear? Yeah, okay. Um, and secondly, I want to get a sense of how many people have questions? Could you just raise your hand if you have a question? Okay. So we have about 15 minutes. So we'd like to try to keep uh, each question to one or two minutes. That would be ideal. And uh, if we have more time, that's great. And if we need to ask this gentleman back, we can do that as well. So, um, Who are you calling a gentleman? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to offend you. <laughs> Hi, my name is Lisa Lax. I'm actually a graduate of the EDD program at UVM, and I'm a, long, and I'm a former employee. Okay. Um, so I have a lot of support for UVM. I think it does add a lot of vitality to our uh, community. However, housing is a big concern. And we heard something, I think, different at a former NPA meeting, just to let you know. I think we heard that the um, percentage of students housed on campus is closer to 50%. So that's a little bit of cl conflicting information. And then the other thing that we heard is that the housing, I can the occupancy rate is like you're pretty booked all of your housing, which suggests that students do want to live on campus, and that there may not be enough housing for them on campus. Um, so just that's a comment, and I it is something it it ha, it's a huge driver in terms of cost, and. Um, you know, quantity of housing that's available. So it is a big concern. You're, you're right to address it in your first visit with us. So thank you. Thank you, Lisa. You know, I, um, I've, I've uh, insisted on very careful checking of all the numbers that I've been using, and I'm pretty confident about the number, but I don't know where this 50 would have come unless something's changed, Joe. I don't know where the 50 would have come from either. We do have 63% of our undergraduates on campus. Um, and we're looking at what other kinds of housing might be explored for undergraduates and graduate students on campus. You know, with the idea that if we build the right kind of housing, people will choose to live there. Um, and it could be housing for, you know, 20 something year old people who are going to, you know, want to live on campus. Um, so we, we hear that loud and clear. We do want to explore that. And then just in terms of impact, we know we have an impact on rentals and, in neighborhoods, we have about 3,000 undergraduate students living off campus. If there are 60% of people that are renters in Burlington, that's, I think the math that I did was something like 13 or 14% of renters are students. So while we do have an impact, it's at about that level. So, and it's my understanding that you're just completing a, a housing study and that the, it will be ready for, for uh, uh, unveiling to here at the NPA in, in December or January. Is that, is right. that fair? We'll and, be coming back to you soon. Yeah. And we're also, uh, a little bit later in the agenda, we'll be talking about having a special meeting separate from usual NPA meetings to talk just about this very issue. So um, we'll, we'll be revisiting this. So Keith, I think you have something. This does yep. this work? Yes. Okay. I, I'm Keith Pillsbury. I live on University Terrace. I've been there for 45 years. And we, when we first bought, our, our street was for 
uh, employees of the university, and it was, it was actually the only house we could afford in Burlington. Um, now my son's trying to find a house in Burlington, he can't afford to. Uh, but I really want to talk about what will impact the housing costs is if you have plans for increasing your enrollment. We've seen some increases in enrollment because of the popularity of the university. Do you foresee increases in enrollment of, our, of, new, of students who come into UVM? If I understand correctly, you're asking if the number of students at UVM will go up. Right. Um, I, I I don't foresee that as a as a plan. We're not we're not moving forward with with that um, understanding at all. So the students we do get, we want to get the best students and graduate them quickly and and uh, do the right thing by them so that their costs are lower. And we'll try to do all we can on affordability for our students. But uh, the plan's not to increase the number of students. Richard. Thanks. Um, thanks for coming. Uh, I'm really glad you talked about um, a graduating students staying in the state because that's either an invisible import or an invisible export, whichever way you look at it. And uh, I'm just wondering if you can expand a little bit on um, any initiatives that you do have to work with um, people in the city and the county and in the, at the state level to keep students here, because I think it's so important we're losing our young people uh, and um, what, whether or not you've picked it up or not, housing is, the cost of living in this area is very high and the average wage is very low and that's very difficult dynamic uh, uh, to sell young people to and I just wonder if you can uh, 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 expound a little bit on what your your first initiative thanks right uh, very happy to do and I think that's a very good question uh, I do think that the stiff problem that you posed of uh, low wages and high expenses is is not something that's in my control to do anything with um, I think the citizens of Vermont seem to choose to um, uh, choose a certain way of living and a certain way of taxation and so on that you know I it's, it's beyond um, my, um, you know, beyond my ability to comment on. But the first part of your question is one of great interest to me. Um, I have in my first, uh, what, three months or so here, visited the entire state. I've been in every part of the state. Um, I've met with legislators and other sort of community leaders throughout the state. So as of, I think, last week, I was in St. Albans, and I've covered it all. In fact, the one thing I've not done is to meet with the local legislators in Burlington. So that's coming up, which uh, um, will happen. That's also scheduled. So um, in these visits, I've also, uh, or besides the visits, I've also met with a good number of business leaders, um, I think almost all business leaders I had a list of, um, nonprofit leaders, uh, chambers of commerce folks, et cetera, just to get a better understanding of um, the challenges in the state and such. I'm uh, very much aware that uh, the workforce is dropping in almost every county, well, is dropping in every county, including in Chittenden, and so um, we need to do a lot. So I think one of the things I, um, I sort of briefly said up front is the student experience that I care so much about uh, means that we need to ensure that they are successful when they leave as well. So I think from their very first semester that they're here, I would like for us to have a better um, arrangement where the students are thinking about a successful career. So we'd like to connect them to internships and community service and service learning and so on. Um, the flip side of that is that employers in Vermont uh, also need to be um, I think we need to socialize with them how they can better engage with our students. If our students um, are in their senior year and haven't thought about a career in Vermont, they're going to leave. I think we need to have our employers, dairy farmers, maple farmer, whatever, maple, what are they called? Producers, um, et cetera, but, but business folks all sort of connect to our um, students all along and show them that there's a life, there's life after UVM in the state. Um, so I, I am having those conversations. We will strengthen our sort of um, internship placement type operation. I do think, by the way, that 68% of our, st our students that come, our in-state students that come to uh, UVM staying in the state is actually 69% or something, is a very good number. 
Um, it's actually higher than I'm used to in other states. Uh, but I think the, the, uh, the fact that we add 30, 31% of out-of-staters uh, to the state's economy is, is a big deal. So I think the most direct answer to your question is trying to better connect our, um, our businesses, our you know, needs that are there in the state for people with our students, and we'll do that in a very deliberate way. We have about five more minutes. Um, sir, could you grab the... Yeah. Sure. I, the, uh, if Vermont still is not there, it was, the la it was the 50th of all the states for state aid to the, to the uh, state colleges, if I remember right. 49th, I think. Or oh, something. so we moved up one. <laughs> well, maybe we're teetering Man, between we 49 rocking. and 50. Sorry. But it's a, serious, it's a serious problem because, you know, when you have states... When you have North Carolina, so if the taxpayer if they, and who's paying the uh, um, paying the dues lives there for two years, the kids can go to school. So they make it much more affordable and takes less of a chunk out of it, out of the, the family wages and so on. I mean, there's no reason why some of my, you know, I, I have friends, kids who's a, who are graduating with two hundred thousand dollars in student loans. Um, people go back to school in their 30s and they come out six years later owing $150,000 in student loan. The numbers don't, it never works out. The gain is like when they hit 56 years old is when they finally have a gain from going back to college because of the lost wages while they go, plus compounded by the debt service. What can, we, what can we do in Vermont to try to take care of the kids that are here that are coming out of high school to make it much more affordable for them to stay? Because I can remember a few years back there was a study when I lived in Essex Junction probably 10 or 11 years ago only 40% of the seniors graduating class of Essex High School stayed. The other 60% left the state and they were gone for three years after that. So they hadn't, that, that's as far about they studied. How do we keep them here? But we don't, we don't just keep them here when they graduate from college. We keep them here because we make college affordable. We make, you know, and we have, not only do we have the jobs here, but how do we keep them here and how do we make it college more affordable for our students? Yeah, thank you for the question. And it's, it strikes at the heart of what I said at the beginning about our student experience and, and their success. And I think their success is also very strongly tied to our not loading them with a lot of debt, right? You will be very proud to hear that those 200,000-ish numbers that you're uh, citing, which are very real, um, are not uh, the numbers for UVM. Our um, average student debt is like 28,000 or so and average, which means there's a fair number of students who are graduating without any debt. Um, I can look up the numbers, it's 34%, something like that, that graduate without debt. Um, anyone remember? I, we'll, we can get back to you on that, anyway, right? So, um, and uh, I, I do think that the cost of education, right? UVM is an expensive public institution. You know, a very clear reason why it's expensive is that we get very, very little support from the state, right? So. On the other hand, I mean, we could beat up on the state, but the state doesn't have a lot of excess money to hand out. So I think we need to get better at how we run our business and try to raise more money from our alumni and donors and such, all of which we'll do. I think we'll try to continue to look at how we do our uh, business. I mean, again, to, to all those numbers you mentioned, the fact that almost half of Vermonters attend UVM tuition free is, I think, a very big deal. Um, and that a good number of them stay in the state is a very big deal. So this will continue to be the most important focus for me. So you'll hear a lot. Hello, President Garamella. Nice Hello. to see you. Um, I'm just wondering how you believe students can be effective community members, and on top of that, how we can all work to better foster positive relationships between students and long-term community members and residents. It's actually an amazingly important question, a very good question, and I'll come back and talk to you, you know, offline and, tell, and ask you how you can. You know, I think that um, I'm hoping that in our conversations we get to a place uh, between the, you know, between the students, between us and the community of um, recognizing how important each is to the other, right? Uh, UVM is a, I'm assuming you all agree in our College of Medicine that we're in. Uh, we're actually having the legislators over here um, next week uh, to, to talk to them about what the College of Medicine does. So I think we need to be better at telling our story. 
Um, and um, we need to be better neighbors. I think that we invest a fair amount of money in neighborhood policing, it's a patrol or whatever, right, uh, kind of stuff. But, you know, I live right in the heart of campus and there's fraternities around and, you know, I've heard some noises around 4 a.m. But, um, I, so, look, it's a college town in some ways, parts of it. Uh, and I think we just have to figure out how best we can um, perhaps change the narrative a little bit. I mean, if, this, if you as students end up feeling like the city doesn't want you here or want you in their uh, neighborhoods and such, that would be really sad. On the other hand, you know, if you could shovel your neighbor's driveway or something while you're staying there, uh, maybe that will do some good. But um, I just, you know, I don't have a specific answer, but uh, I just hope that the tone of the conversation, the, the, the way we interact with each other is respectful, um, we listen to each other, et cetera. So, um, but we should talk about that. I, let us talk about how you as students can uh, play a bigger role. By the way, the, f the fact that so many of UVM students are, are so interested in the community and are in the service learning uh, sort of um, kinds of things, you volunteer, et cetera, et cetera, I'm sure there's a fair amount of the community that is very appreciative of your um, contributions to the city. Um, so maybe we should celebrate those. And, yeah. so. and one of the things I want to celebrate is that the number of students coming each, each meeting here is growing. And this, this is a perfect forum for that kind of conversation of, yeah, so thank you. <laughs> so we want to continue this conversation and this is a great place to, to have part of that conversation. So thanks for coming. And thank you, Cindy, for saying that. That's, that's great. Um, yes, could you, Keith, could you pass the... Uh, no, maybe I'm good without it. Yeah, no, it's you for, the, it? for okay. Channel 17 okay, as good. much as anything. Yeah. President Garmel, thank you so much for coming. Of I'm course. wearing two hats tonight. I, um, I'm a Ward 1 resident. I live on Mansfield Avenue. I also work for the city, and later tonight I'll, uh, with my um, colleague and the general manager of the Burlington Electric Department, do a presentation on the net zero energy plan for the city, yes. which is essentially our plan to transition off of fossil fuels in the heating um, and ground transportation sectors. And before I sort of launch into my transportation piece, I do want to say that VED has been a repository. We, we work with many, many UVM students, many service learning classes, and it's, it's always a good experience. And we're one of these businesses that you can count on to help incubate um, right. students. So and thank you for that. I, I do know this. I've heard that you're great partners, and, uh, and I appreciate all that you do for yeah, our students. Anytime. Thank you. We're looking forward to the spring semester when we'll have another cadre. But great. I did want to mention, since you won't be here later for the presentation, that part of our plan uh, will entail moving off of fossil fuels and ground transportation, and more specifically, reducing vehicle miles traveled by 15% per household. So the qua things change in Burlington. Um, in August, late August, when the students come on campus and traffic increases sort of pretty precipitously. Um, so I say that um, as an opportunity and an invitation. I hope we can work together to figure out how we can incentivize students not bringing cars to campus and how we can celebrate this idea of a city that um, stands on the platform of multimodal transportation. Yeah. I know students really appreciate that yes. and that's one of the key reasons I think that Burlington is so attractive is because yeah. we celebrate our environmental sustainability and I think reducing vehicle miles traveled is one right. key component of that. I, I think you've captured the students' uh, ethos wonderfully well. I mean certainly I'm, I've been hearing from the Student Government Association everybody else about their commitment to the environment, to climate change. You know, we've had the, the parades and so on. Wonderful. I'm all for it. I, my research is in renewable energy and in, you know, thermal energy storage from solar, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I'm a big fan and, um, you know, we're investing more of our um, university resources in renewable energy, for instance. So very happy to, um, to hear of this. Uh, we pay for um, transportation, buses, yeah, right? So um, yeah, say a little about that just in case. Sure. And Jim Barr is here as well and does a tremendous amount of work on, you know, TDM and yeah, let's hear it for Jim. Come on. <laughs> He does a lot of work. He really does. We, you know, there's a lot that's been, <laughs> there's a lot that happens and not to get into all the details, but I'll. I've never seen anybody clap for the director of parking, so you must be doing something. <laughs> and he's blushing. It's really cute. I know. It's very cute. It's unprecedented, I think. Um, but, you know, 
if you want to learn more, you know, go to Jim's website. Um, but to be honest, I just got involved in CATBA and just learned a little bit more about what goes on with TDM. We're offering so many different ways to get around now. You know, we have a shuttle that moves people around efficiently. Went to CNG su shuttles, you know, some years ago before many other people did. Um, we're looking at other micro uh, uh, transportation as well, micro mobility with, you know, uh, bike share, with hopefully electric bikes coming. Um, and, you know, we're doing the best we can to coordinate with other partners in the city, including GMT, on the best way to move people around. So hear what you're saying, totally get that. And I think the city is going to be working some with the neighborhood project as well on, you know, how to move people around in a different way and how to manage parking and, and, and uh, mobility in the city as well. And, and I want to end on a serious note and say I walk to work every day. <laughs> Good. Some of you know why that's a joke. but. Okay. <laughs> So uh, thank you for being here. Um, I know you have limited time. So um, and uh, obviously there's a lot to talk about. So uh, hopefully we can continue the conversation over time. And um, if you have additional questions, perhaps what, the, what should they do? How, how should they be? Oh, in touch I think with us? It, Joe and Joe? others are yeah. staying yeah. here. Sure. So of course by yeah. all means, and sure. we talk all the time. But I just want to thank you for the opportunity. Thank all of you for. The, the good discussion, and I think some of the questions that came up, and thanks to the students. I love you guys. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Okay. So we're going to keep moving because we've got a lot to, to cover. Um, so the, we're on the business uh, side of things, uh, if you're looking at the agenda. First thing up is uh, we've been trying to get more Ward 8 uh, steering committee members. And um, uh, I believe at the last meeting, Hannah spoke a bit, where is that? Yeah, ab about uh, being interested in serving. I'm wondering if there are other folks from Ward 8 uh, that are interested in being on the steering committee. No? Okay, so, so this is a Ward 8 thing and not a Ward 1 thing. I don't know if you are familiar with which ward you are in. Uh, but uh, the vote for the Ward 8 steering committee is just for Ward 8 folks. So um, are there, do you want to close the nominations or are there any? I just thought I would uh, formally nominate Hannah. Okay, great. <laughs> that sounds like a second to me. <laughs> um, are, there, are there any other nominations? Do you want to close the nominations and vote? Well, I move to close the nominations. Great. Um, so, yes, I can't hear. Um, what's your last name? King. Um, okay, so, yes. Make a statement? Yeah. Okay. Brief. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Hannah King, and I'm running for Ward 8 Steering Committee. I moved to Burlington last year with the intention of making this my permanent community. Throughout my time here, I've had the opportunity to engage with other wards through attending their, through attending their MPAs, along with staying informed and engaged with other city meetings. The reality is the relationship between permanent residents and students has been fragmented in the past, but just over the past year, I've seen that through productive conversation, we can not only strengthen that relationship, but create meaningful partnerships. Through my involvement with the Community Coalition, a monthly meeting which looks at neighborhood projects, I've had the opportunity to engage further with community stakeholders and look critically at issues affecting students and permanent residents alike. Along with that, this year I've been working closely with the BTV Low Barrier Homeless Shelter to organize a drive to provide the members in our community without a place to stay winter warming kits. If elected, I look forward to working not only with the committee members, but with all of you. Thank you. Thanks, Hannah. So I'm going to move this along. Um, I think nominations are closed. There's one nominee uh, up, Hannah King. Um, all those of you that live in uh, Ward 8, um, if you're in favor, say aye. Aye. Opposed? Congratulations and condolences, Hannah. <laughs> Glad to have you for a bunch of reasons. It's really, really especially nice to have uh, a UVM. Uh, representative here, and, and so thank you. Thank you. Um, so um, next up is a res resolution regarding the safety of uh, pedestrians on East Avenue, 
and Karen's passing that around. Um, I've been, uh, the community has been circulating a petition asking that the city uh, take seriously the concerns regarding pedestrian safety on, on uh, the, particularly on the crosswalk at the top of Billado Court that comes right up here to the medical center, which is very heavily used. And a month or so ago, uh, a woman was fairly significantly hurt uh, when she was hit by a, a vehicle um, and taken away by ambulance. Uh, a few days later, somebody's uh, vehicle stopped to, for, for a pedestrian in the walkway and was rear-ended. It's an ongoing issue um, where um, the steering committee is, is asking if this, this group wants to um, uh, endorse the resolution that is being passed around now. And uh, I'll, I guess I'll just read it for, uh, whereas Burlington <coughs> prides itself in being a walkable city and whereas safety is of paramount importance and whereas a pedestrian was struck within the crosswalk on East Avenue at the top of Bilbo Court at 639 on October 23rd and was injured significantly enough that she was taken to the medical center on a stretcher and a car was rear-ended while stopping at this crosswalk just a few days later. And whereas a significant percentage of vehicles on East Avenue in this area have been documented to travel at a speed of 10 miles per hour or more above the speed limit. And whereas visibility is challenged at the East Avenue Builder Court crosswalk due to vegetation and lighting limitations. And whereas over 100 people have signed a petition calling for action to improve safety on East Avenue. And whereas a request for traffic calming for East Avenue was submitted two and a half years ago. Therefore, we, we being the, this group, the Neighborhood Planning Assembly, if it's your pleasure to endorse this, request that the City of Burlington take immediate action to make crossings on East Avenue safe for pedestrians by implementing measures such as removing vegetation on the west side of the Builder Court intersection, improving lighting in the area, installing safety features at the crossings that improve visibility and slow traffic such as rapid flashing pedestrian lights, stop signs, speed bumps, speed radar signs and other measures, and accelerate action on the request for traffic calming, move East up Avenue up on the complete streets queue, identify other crossings in the city that pose similar risks to pedestrians and take action, and direct the City Department of Public Works to prioritize improving crosswalk safety. So that's a lot. Um, so uh, we don't have a lot of time for discussion about this. Um, I think it's something that's come up a number of times in the past. I'm just uh, uh, looking to see if this group is ready to consider um, endorse, deciding whether or not you, you choose to endorse this resolution. Um, are you ready to, to have that? Yes, Sharon. I would like to move the resolution. Great. Okay, uh, yeah. so, several seconds? Okay. So. Yes. And I just wanted to state that I know Jason Williams is here tonight from um, the medical center, but um, at a meeting that was here at the medical center, Dave Kelty mentioned um, the crossing at University Road um, where he referenced a, a near miss between a car and a pedestrian. Um, that was news to me. I didn't realize that. So I'm hoping that. Um, that the medical center will look at that and see if they want to send a communication in support of this resolution that could be included when it goes to the city council packet. And I, based on your recommendation, I forwarded this resolution to Jason just uh, earlier today, so they haven't had an opportunity to run it through channels. Right. Uh, but I think that's that's in process. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So let's come back to the uh, NPA uh, take on this resolution. Do you, you want further discussion or are you ready to call the question? Yeah. I would just like to add two things. It really goes to you. Do you want to use the word complete streets on this one? Because you could lose parking on East Avenue. I know you're a big advocate for it because you have some houses that don't even have parking. So I just, I just wonder if you want to. I'm all for the traffic calm, but that's a big deal. Well, that, that's a whole different piece. No, that's, that's um, that mentioned in here. It is mentioned in here, but but that's something that that, that isn't really being asked to be endorsed. It's something it is, that it I right here. well yeah, but let me just finish that um, uh, there was a petition of a number of residents who asked that uh, DPW consider East Avenue as a complete street two and a half years ago, and that's that's in the queue. It's it, 
nothing that we do here will affect that that I know of. Your call. I know you were concerned about that. So I'm, I'm happy to let this go as is. I think that each street gets evaluated for what the needs are and um, as far as bike lanes and, and sidewalks and vehic vehicular traffic. So I think that that evaluation can happen. I'm, I'm not going to speak in, it, in opposition to that. Okay. Do you have something? Yeah, I was just wondering um, if someone could just give like a really brief, um, I guess, explanation as to what the complete streets queue is for those of us that aren't aware of it. I'd be happy to do that, but let's do that after the meeting if you're going to be here for the whole meeting because I don't want to take up group time on that if we can. I, if it's in regards to this legislation, I think that it's probably important to discuss okay, Let me give you the the very short version, which is um, uh, my understanding of the Complete Streets Initiative is it's looking at streets as a corridor for all kinds of different uh, uh, transportation, not just cars and other motorized vehicles, but also uh, bicycles, pedestrians. Uh, so looking at it as a, a thoroughfare for transportation of all kinds. And so uh, when, when something is analyzed as a complete street, it often in, involves changes to make uh, things uh, friendlier for uh, uh, those that are not motorized vehicles. Okay. So are we ready to call the question? Yes. Okay. So um, all in favor of the NPA endorsing this resolution, aye? Aye. aye. Opposed? Great. So uh, the steering committee will take this to city council and other uh, commissions that are um, uh, that with, within which this is their purview, and we'll uh, get back to you. So the last piece of business is about housing. We we mentioned this briefly earlier. Housing vis-a-vis uh, -vis UVM comes up over and over again. The steering committee is looking at having a standalone meeting just about. UVM and housing, and we're interested in seeing if you all are interested. In the sense that we've gotten in the past is that you are, and more <coughs> importantly, if you are, if you would uh, sign up, and I'll, I'll put a um, sign-up sheet here, would, would love help with how to structure a conversation that's as useful as possible. So just a sense of, do you think that a, um, a couple of hour meeting some evening or weekend would be useful to just really shine a bright light on um, how UVM and housing in the and neighborhoods interrelate. Is that something that would would be a useful conversation? I'm seeing nods. Okay, so um, we'll put up a sign up sheet here, and um, the more energy we get, the better of uh, um, you know across the sector of uh, people that are affected by this. So we appreciate it. All right. So great, thank you. So we've moved on to speak out. Um, and this is a chance to make announcements, raise concerns, stuff that you want to speak to that, that um, you have concerns about. And yeah, could, um, Adam, could you pass the microphone back there? I can also. To live? Okay. Oh, she can. <laughs> cool. And let me get a sense of uh, how many other people are interested in speaking out. Okay. Okay. Great. Over to you. Hi, everyone. A lot of you know me, um, and I've seen me before, although there's lots of faces I don't know. So I'm Zoraya Hightower. Um, I am running for city councilor in Ward 1. So I just wanted to uh, take the time to introduce myself a little bit and also hand out some literature that I have. Um, I moved to Burlington around four years ago. I originally rented on Colchester Ave a few months ago. I bought, um, I did buy a unit in the River Watch Apartments, um, kind of to escape the rental market. Um, and I'm excited to be a much more permanent resident now. I started going to the NPAs about a year and a half ago. I'm on the Development Review Board and excited to be running for city councilor now. Um, mostly going to be running on an affordable housing and transit platform. Um, I brought flyers, so there's a little bit more information about that. I'm happy to talk about any of these um, afterwards. The flyer also has the Progressive Caucus on it. Um, I'm still making decisions on how exactly I'm going to be labeled during my race, but I definitely um, am excited to be very aligned with a lot of the progressive values and um, 
Jack and others um, who are on the council now and would absolutely love to be um, endorsed by the progressive nomination, so show up for that as well. Um, yeah, I'm excited to be running, excited to be like knocking on a lot of your doors in the next few months, and please feel free to ask me any questions if you have them. Um, I'm also announcing that I'm running for city council, but uh, I don't have a speech prepared. I just didn't want to use up my, my city council update time. People have been asking, wondering whether or not I'm going to run. I have uh, been doing this for almost five years, and I have a lot of energy left, and so I will be coming back and seeking re-election just to put that to bed. Um, I'm not focused much on it now. It's before Thanksgiving, but since the conversations are starting, I figured I'd just let folks know. Um, we'll be talking a lot more over the coming months, so I look forward to it. Great. Do you want to see? Do you want me to? Oh, well, hi, um, I'm Sharon Busher, um, and I had stated in October that I was going to seek re-election uh, for my seat in Ward One. So I guess I will just restate that. Um, now that I am retired, I've found a lot more time and energy to put into issues um, for the ward, and I look forward to being able to do that. And just like um, Zariah, I will be knocking on doors and interacting with you in a number of different ways. So thank you, and as usual, please feel free to reach out to me with any issues that you have on your mind. Thank you. Thanks. Keith. Um, I'm Keith Pillsbury. I am the Ward 8 School Commissioner. I just wanted to announce that we're having a school budget forum uh, tomorrow night at 7 p starting at 7 p.m. at Hunt Middle School. Anybody has some comments or concerns about the Burlington School budget or the development of the fiscal 21 budget, uh, that would be a place to bring your comments and concerns. Hunt Middle School, 7 p.m. tomorrow night. Great. Thanks. Go ahead. Hi everyone, so I've been working alongside Sally and Skylar Nash to organize a month of giving to benefit the BTV Low Barrier Shelter downtown. In just over, in 13 days we've raised over $750. Um, we are collecting money donations along with a list of like various items to make winter warming kits to hand out to our homeless neighbors. Um, so I'm going to post on Front Porch Forum the list and also like send it out to whoever is interested if you would be willing to donate. Thank you. Anybody else for speak out? Yes. Keith, could you just, yeah. Oh. <laughs> I just want to thank our representatives from the police and fire department who come here. I think it's important that we get to know them and they get to know us, and I think it's important that we thank them for all that they do for us. Thank you. Great. Anybody else? All right. So we're going to just keep moving here. Um, so next up is uh, Burlington Electric Department. And uh, uh, we understand you're going to do a presentation and then have uh, 10 minutes or so for Q&A. Is that, does that work? <laughs> or maybe a little bit less. Yeah, whatever works yeah. for you. Okay. <coughs> yeah, I, I'm clueless. I'm totally clueless about this. So, so if you could ex uh, introduce yourselves as, as he, Jason's working his magic, that'd be great. Sure. Okay, thanks, Karen. Can, I Can you give her a mic? Yeah. Um, hi, everyone. I feel like I'm home. It's nice to be around the corner from um, Mansfield Avenue, and thank you very much for, for having us. My name is Jennifer Green, and I work for the Burlington Electric Department. I am the city's uh, sustainability officer, and I'm really pleased to be here with Darren Springer, who's the general manager of BED. We're here tonight to tell you a little bit about our net R, as in the city of Burlington's um, net zero energy strategy. And you know, in other words, our transition <coughs> off of fossil fuels in the thermal and ground transportation sectors. So let's see. Um, we're gonna spend just a few minutes um, with Darren kicking it off, telling you a little bit, reminding many of you about BED's history in the community and our 
um, renewable energy portfolio. Um, then we'll tell you a little bit about some of the data that was uncovered during our roadmap process, our roadmap on how to get to net zero energy. Um, and then we'll wrap it up with um, a summation of some of the programs and initiatives that we have through BED, which um, are helping us as a community um, reach this, this major milestone. Darren. Great. Hi, everybody. It's great to be with you. Um, I'm not a Ward 1-8. I'm a Ward 7 resident, but uh, good to be here. And um, uh, for those who may not be familiar, and, and for some who are, uh, we're Burlington Electric. We're your public power municipal uh, utility, uh, electric utility. We have about eight, 118 employees between our Pine Street offices and the McNeil plant uh, down at the Intervale. Um, we are uh, in the process of going our 11th year now without having raised rates. Uh, so we're, we're doing uh, a lot on the fiscal side, try to keep rates steady. Um, just some statistics here, uh, you know, we're unique in Vermont that we have about uh, three quarters of our customers are residential, 60% uh, of our customers are renters, um, but if you think about our energy use, about uh, three quarters of our electric use is coming from our commercial customers. Um, so we have a lot of renters, which is unique for Vermont. Uh, we also have a significant amount of electric use uh, in the commercial sector. Um, you can see here, McNeil uh, Power Plant is the largest energy producer now in the state of Vermont uh, after Vermont Yankee was closed in 2013. And, um, you know, we are, and I'll, I'll mention on a uh, couple slides from now, but we were recognized as a community in 2014 being the first community in the nation to source 100% of our power uh, from renewable generation. Um, we're real proud of the work we've done on energy efficiency. Uh, this is a photo from last year's energy efficiency calendar contest. Uh, all the fourth grade public schools uh, have the opportunity for kids to participate and compete in the calendar contest. Uh, this year it's going to be the net zero energy calendar contest, reflecting our work on net zero energy that we're here to talk about uh, today. Um, we have, as a community, since uh, the 80s, been investing in energy efficiency. And, uh, you know, in 1990, we had an $11.3 million bond for energy efficiency. Um, we are using approximately 6% less electricity today as a community than we were in 1989. Uh, the rest of the state is up around 8.4% during that time period. The country is up almost 30% during that time period. So if the rest of the country was on the Burlington trajectory, uh, you'd be talking about more than 200 coal plants worth of energy that wouldn't be needed uh, nationally. So we start all of our work from a foundation of energy efficiency, uh, having made progress there. And we're saving roughly 12 million annually on electric bills uh, through our efficiency work for our customers uh, and have invested between our customers and BED about 70 million over the last few decades in energy efficiency. We also, as I mentioned, we are 100% uh, renewable. Uh, this um, graph uh, or pie chart really on the, on the far side here uh, shows our different resources. Roughly a third of our electricity is from the McNeil plant, uh, so biomass. Uh, about a third of our electricity is coming from hydropower, um, some of which is local from the Winooski One uh, hydro facility, uh, as well as other Vermont-based hydropower facilities. And uh, we get a little less than a third of our electricity from wind, uh, we have two projects in Vermont that we get power from and one in Maine. And we have a small but growing slice of our uh, energy, you can see it in orange here, uh, coming from solar. It's 1.4%. Uh, uh, the year prior it was 0.3%, so it's actually growing pretty rapidly. And we were recognized uh, as a community by Environment America for being the top community per capita in solar in New England and number four in the United States. And I think we have an opportunity to move to number two in the U.S. in the next survey. So if uh, folks are thinking about solar, please, uh, please move forward with it. Help us move up the rankings. Um, we're here tonight to talk about net zero energy. I'm going to turn it over to Jen, and then I'll uh, take it back in a few minutes to talk about some of our incentive programs. Great. Thank you, Darren. Um, so sort of building on this portfolio of 100 percent renewable electricity, it was time to take it to the next level. And this is when um, the mayor announced that we were going to take on the next big audacious task, which was to build on that platform and transition essentially, as I mentioned, off of fossil fuels in the heating and ground transportation sectors. So really ambitious. I think, honestly, um, I haven't heard of another city that has a goal um, quite this audacious. There are lots of cities that are focused on net zero energy in buildings, but to add the transportation component is, is really significant and I think something we should all be proud of. 
Um, we knew that we couldn't do it alone. We couldn't do this roadmap in-house. So um, make a long story short, after a fairly elaborate uh, request for proposal process, um, we selected uh, Synapse Energy Economics um, to conduct the roadmap for us. And it was released um, in September. And I appreciate many of you were, were there and uh, st stood in support of the, of the roadmap. Um, Part of um, Synapse's efforts were to first assess sort of business as usual and where we are vis-a-vis -vis our energy use in the city. And then it was to come up with sort of concrete pathways that we could follow that would help us sort of see the, the light at the end of the tunnel vis-a-vis -vis, uh, net zero. So sort of quick and dirty 20,000 foot analysis. Um, as you can see, um, our energy in Burlington overall is sort of divided up into four sections. However, um, this sort of grid line um, looks specifically at transportation that's originating outside of Burlington, so not something that we in the city have a whole lot of control over. Um, if you look at the two gray sections, you'll see building, both commercial and residential, uh, with, with internal transportation, i.e. travel in, in and around Burlington represented by the, by the black slice of the, of the pie. So if you take this grid section out, you'll see that we really need to focus on buildings primarily and then um, transportation as well. And you know, by the way, it was great to have the president here and to be able to, um, to hear what he had to say about um, our work together on uh, the transportation sector vis-a-vis -vis UVM. So as I mentioned, the first order of business was to look at where we are regarding energy use. The business as usual case, which is the black line across the top, shows a small sort of decline in energy use. It's not going to be quick or fast enough if we're really going to transition to net zero and indeed um, reduce carbon emissions. Getting to net zero by 2030 is going to be a pretty significant lift, as you can see. It's a, it's a fairly steady decline in, in, in um, um, as, as demonstrated on the chart here. Just for kicks, we wanted to see what it would look like to get to 2040. And you can see, again, it's precipitous, but not nearly as um, sort of, again, audacious as our 2030 goal. Audacious and exciting, I would add. Um, one of the exciting pieces to me of this roadmap is the degree to which um, transitioning to net zero off of fossil fuels is going to have a huge carbon impact for our city as well. Um, indeed, we're going to have to move off of petroleum uh, as well as, as natural gas. And when we do, we will have decreased our emissions um, over sort of 50% in, in both cases. Um, the last slide I want to show you um, is a sum summation of what we're going to need to tackle. So if you think of um, our whole roadmap as a pie with different slices that we're going to have to take on, the first and biggest slice of the pie is going to be the building sector. Indeed, we're going to need to electrify about 60% um, of our buildings. This will mean, particularly from a heating standpoint, moving away from, from gas in order to do that. The second piece is electrifying vehicles. The, uh, when I see a new car sort of, uh, you know, on Mansfield Avenue, I think what a lost opportunity. So as we're purchasing new cars, we really we need to make them electric. Um, third, and of particular relevance since we're here um, up at the medical center and near UVM, is this component of district heating. 15% of our challenge will be um, the district heating component, of which, you know, Darren can speak more of if there are specific questions. Last but not least is this emphasis on uh, multimodal transportation. As I mentioned to the president, we're going to need to transition ourselves away from driving to the extent when we have to the extent that we can. Indeed, 50% um, of uh, vehicle miles traveled reduced um, per household. Um, I'm going to give the mic back to Darren and let him talk about what we've got going on. Great, thank you, Jen. Um, I want to say thank you to our city councilors. Uh, the city council passed a resolution supporting the net zero energy efforts uh, as part of also declaring uh, a climate emergency. And uh, at BED, we are we had already been doing a number of programs to help customers transition to clean energy technologies. Uh, we launched some new ones as well. Um, you can go to our website, BurlingtonElectric.com, uh, to read the roadmap report and to check out all of the different incentives. Um, in particular, I want to mention we have an incentive program essentially across all modes of transportation. So uh, our e-bike program has been very popular. Uh, there are six local 
bike shops where you can get an instant $200 off uh, of an electric bike, electric assist bike, uh, which can be used to commute around the community. I know we've got a few e-bikers here, I think, uh, as well, uh, and Jen's one, and I know Jack as well. Um, EVs, plug-in hybrids, uh, we have incentives for new and pre-owned uh, electric vehicles and plug-in hybrids. Uh, if you haven't driven an electric vehicle, uh, we are working on opportunities to make those as affordable as possible. Uh, they're a lot of fun to drive, uh, they're very efficient, and uh, there are a lot of different models out there, a lot of all-wheel drive models coming on, so there's, there's good models for Vermont's climate. Uh, we also are working with Green Mountain Transit to bring the first two electric transit buses to their fleet uh, this year. Uh, we've provided incentives for those. So we're trying to electrify across all modes of transportation. Uh, we also have uh, incentives for cold climate heat pumps, uh, for heat pump hot water heaters, which are efficient, uh, electric heating opportunities. Uh, if anybody is in the market for a forklift, uh, we have electric forklift incentives for you. And uh, as well as we've had a very popular electric lawnmower incentive. Uh, if it uses energy, we want to make it electric as much as possible, and we're trying to help make that happen. Um, I want to mention, too, that you know, we, we talk about a number of these things, and sometimes people ask about the economic uh, impact, the economic benefit. Uh, one of the things we looked at with the roadmap is you know, where are our dollars going? Um, if you spend a dollar at the gas station uh, in Vermont, uh, roughly 80 cents of that dollar leaves the state's economy. Uh, we don't produce uh, petroleum here in Vermont, so we don't have a lot of economic benefit from using petroleum. If you spend a dollar charging a vehicle with Burlington Electric, 100% renewable electricity, more than half the dollar stays in the state's economy and more than three quarters of the dollar stays in the regional economy. So we always think about buying local. Uh, we wanna buy local energy. Uh, the local electric utility is the local energy uh, in this case. Um, it's also cheaper to drive electric. I don't know if, if this is, you know, is widely appreciated, but um, when you're driving electric, you can pay the equivalent of about a buck fifty to a buck forty a gallon uh, at our public charging stations, and if you happen to be on our residential uh, charging rate, you can pay as low as sixty cents a gallon equivalent. Uh, so it's cheaper to drive electric than to drive on gasoline. Um, so that's part of the message that we want to share: is these solutions not only benefit the environment, but they can be economically beneficial for our community as well. And um, maybe I'll just stop there and see if folks have uh, questions or comments uh, for us. And thank you very much for for your attention. Appreciate it. Hi. <clears throat> Yikes. Uh oh, I hope that was just water. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I wondered about, and I've heard about this, but I live, you know, a couple blocks away in a hundred and some year old house with, we have gas heat and uh, s steam radiators and stuff. With this program, I mean, how would m many of us have houses like this? How would we ever hook over to this heat pump? system? Yeah, no, it's a, it's a good question. And in a lot of cases with heat pumps, we're not talking at, at the moment with current technology about replacing your entire heating system with a heat pump, although there are buildings that are very weatherized, very efficient, and are able to do that. Um, but really, we're talking about is a kind of a hybrid home type of solution. Oh, sure. Um, so, you know, when you have a heat pump, you can space heat and space cool a section of a home. You can do an entire home. Depends what you're looking to, to try to accomplish. Um, personally, I have heat pumps uh, in all of the upstairs bedrooms in my home. And so we basically can turn off the natural gas for that entire zone and just use the heat pumps. Now, there can be issues if it's a historic building or if there's uh, different challenges around that that, that you can work through. But um, the heat pumps are pretty modular. They're pretty uh, easy to install. There's no duct work uh, associated with them. So they can be a solution in a lot of cases. It's basically, uh, technology-wise, it's like a refrigerator in reverse. Um, so it's the same type of technology. So if you, if you put your foot under your refrigerator, you feel hot air coming out. And if you're, if you're using a heat pump, it's basically taking uh, warm air, pumping it into your home very efficiently during the winter. And if you stood outside, there's a unit outside that's basically pumping cold air back out. It's, it's highly efficient. Um, and it also is very, very efficient air conditioning as well in the summertime. Um, so it's, uh, it's a technology that hadn't been used in Vermont as much because until recently you couldn't use it when it was you know, zero or negative five outside. Um, but the new technology can be used down to you know, negative 15, negative 18, uh, reasonably efficiently. So it's, it's only in the last you know, five to six years become a very common technology in Vermont. So we have a, three or four more questions. Go ahead. Um, uh, is this on? Yep. Okay. Um, 
have you guys looked at a uh, possible like offset technology like carbon capture as a way to kind of you know reduce the impact on like residents and kind of uh, make that transition uh, smoother and kind of uh, a smoother transition I guess is the question yeah, we, we haven't had any opportunities to look at carbon capture, but we do have, um, you know, we, we work with Vermont Gas frequently. Uh, they, you know, 95% of the buildings in Burlington uh, heat with gas. Um, they have a program uh, for renewable natural gas, which is essentially a way to offset your natural gas use by buying uh, renewable uh, methane. Um, I think they have some uh, farm digester projects in Vermont that are supposed to come online in the next year. So in the roadmap, um, you'll see that even though we want to electrify, we want to weatherize, we want to make homes and buildings more efficient, we understand there's going to be some component of fossil fuel use that would remain uh, even under the most aggressive scenario by 2030. And we contemplate renewable fuels like renewable natural gas or other renewable fuels helping to fill that gap, essentially. Hi, uh, Darren. Nice to meet you. Uh, Jennifer, good to see you. Um, hi. <laughs> um, so as a former public power employee, I just want to give a shout out to, um, you know, the wonderful model that public power presents to um, not just Vermonters, but Americans in general. I wish more people understood public power uh, and the benefits. Um, my question is, so definitely want to push, um, you know, going carbon free and uh, home heating, things like that, uh, but we don't want to be putting um, heat pumps and mini splits in homes that aren't uh, sealed up and, and aren't weatherized appropriately. So I'm, I just want to make sure that as part of your plan, there's, there's also efforts to make sure that we're getting the maximum efficiency out of those units and out of the installs and out of the money that's being spent. Um, as as um, the woman over there mentioned, old homes um, going to be leaky and, and it's, you're not going to see the results you want. And the last thing we want are people calling and saying, I installed it and it didn't work. It didn't, it didn't do what you said it would. So um, I'm wondering if you can speak to that a little bit. Yeah, no, I mean, we, we don't want any homes uh, to be leaky and, and, and losing energy. And uh, the roadmap basically contemplates that we either have to have weatherized relatively recently or will we uh, weatherize over the next 10 years uh, practically every building in the city. Uh, so some number of buildings, uh, you know, have already been weatherized, have reasonable air sealing, reasonable insulation. They're not leaking, uh, you know, air out into the cold uh, and heating the outdoors. That's great. Um, we want to make sure that every building has the opportunity, every, every rental unit, every home, every, every building. So one of the things that's important in this space, because we can't do everything with incentives, we understand that, is policy. Um, so we understand that, uh, you know, through work that's going on uh, via the housing summit, uh, there's going to be standards, I believe, put forward around rental energy efficiency. Uh, we, we've been looking at standards for new construction. We have city councilors here who have proposed uh, measures in those areas. Um, so really, policy as well as incentives is going to help us get over that uh, you know, barrier. Um, Vermont Gas and Burlington Electric, we both offer incentives. We haven't had a huge amount of uptake on weatherization, so we know that having policy in place is going to make a difference in that area. And, and couldn't agree more with, uh, with your comment. We certainly don't want to put in technology and have it not work correctly. So uh, two more quick questions. Uh, first, I live in an 1890s house on Mansfield and anybody is welcome to come visit my house. We have a heat pump, our whole first floor, um, and we love it. You can't even hear it. And it's both heat and AC. Um, my other half and I work from home, so we're home a lot. And we have to say it is absolutely fantastic. We use it through the, uh, right up until this kind of weather, but for the most part, cooling and heating, it is, and we we're very curious to see what our electric bills would do, and I have to tell you, they hardly budged an inch, so I highly recommend it. I do have a quick question. What do you think of the Tesla storage batteries? Good. Well, first, appreciate that you're using heat pumps. Short answer, please. Yep. Great, great example. Um, we haven't seen a lot of Tesla batteries in Burlington because a lot of places around Vermont where they're doing that, it's because they're having outages, uh, storm outages. Uh, we're fortunate. Uh, some of our grid is underground. Uh, we have a relatively compact service territory. Our average customer doesn't necessarily even see an outage in a given year, and those who do, the duration is usually under an hour. Uh, so we haven't had a business case for the batteries just yet, but we're always exploring it. And it's good technology, and it's working well in the rest of the state uh, so far. Keith. I just want to have a question. How are the incentives funded? 
Yeah, so we have a couple different programs uh, through the state. We're state regulated. Uh, some of it comes through efficiency. There's an efficiency charge on the bill that funds energy efficiency work. And some of it's funded through something called Tier 3, which is essentially a state regulation requiring utilities to do work on electrification and other measures. So we have a budget for that, and we have a budget for energy efficiency work. And those are the primary sources of funding that we use. Great. Uh, thank you, Darren and Jen. Thank you. Uh, yeah, if folks had extra questions, please feel free to reach out. Our, our emails are available online. Thank you. Thank you. And their slides are available on the NPA website. So uh, thank thanks very much. So um, we're going to keep moving. Oh. It's a clapping crowd tonight. They're, they're, they're into it. So thanks. Thank you. So next up is Megan Moir. Is Moyer. Moyer. Yep. Um, so I'll let you introduce yourself because you can speak to it better than I. And welcome. Hi, folks. We're doing electricity and then water back to back, the things that maybe shouldn't mix. But actually, we, we work a lot with our BED partners since we're big electricity users. So I'm Megan Moyer. I'm the division director of uh, the Water Resources Division. So I run the water, wastewater, and stormwater utilities. I've been with the city since 2009, first as a stormwater program manager, and then in the last three years, get to be in charge of all of the waters. I'm joined tonight by our esteemed colleagues, uh, Jessica Lavalette, who she's the one that sends out all of your 10,000 uh, water bills, water sewer stormwater bills. So if you have any questions about bills, you can talk to her. And she's also our finance manager. And then Jenna Calvi, who was our stormwater program coordinator uh, or program manager and now is our water resources policy and programs manager. So really happy to join you guys today to talk a little bit um, about the direction we're going with our rates. Let me just come over here. So before we get into rates, I want to make sure that everybody knows what it is that the water resources utilities do. There are a lot of things are out of sight, out of mind until there isn't water. And so we want to make sure you know all of the services that we provide. Uh, and then we'll talk a little bit about how we got to this point of needing to look at our rates and looking at our finances and making sure that we're collecting sufficient money, uh, go over our existing rates, and then talk to you guys about the the suite of options that we are examining as part of this study with our consultant, Raf Tellis. Before we go there, we need to come back to our, our mission statement, our core set of values, which is we believe that access to clean water is a human right. We share that with the United Nations. They also have said that. Um, and that, that comes down to two things. First, to make sure everybody has access to clean water, we need to make sure we are stewarding our infrastructure. We need to make sure that we are resilient against climate change, we are resilient against water main breaks. We, we're taking care of things in a way that, yes, we're gonna have outages from time to time, but generally speaking, everybody's gonna have access. The other piece, though, is this affordability of services. And sometimes these are a little bit counter opposites, right? If we need enough money to take care of our systems, that means we have to get the money from somewhere and we are solely funded by ratepayers. And so we're kind of looking at this little bit of a conflict and trying to figure out how we're gonna manage that. Because we don't want people having to decide to buy medicine or buy food for their family because they are afraid of being late on their water bill. They need to be able to do both. So stepping back a little, um, Water resources is not funded by any of your taxpayer dollars. It is what we call enterprise funds. They're operated as little businesses. And in fact, each of the three utilities, and those are the budgets, it's over about $17.4 million in total, each utility has to collect its own money. So when we charge you for your water bill, we're not taking the water money and spending it in wastewater or wastewater money in, into stormwater. They're, they have to be self-contained uh, units. Um, as I said, there is no reliance on, on property services. In total, we serve um, 10,000 connections, so there's 10,000 uh, wastewater or water lines that go into people's homes, and that serves over you know, 42,000 42, people in Burlington and a small part of Colchester. We do sell some water to Colchester, and that's sort of a leftover from the old days where we actually provided water to a lot of the surrounding communities. We currently have 43 full-time staff, of which we have those two amazing ladies back there. And then stepping into the specific functions, what we worry about day in, day out. The Water Enterprise Fund, its main purpose is to make sure we withdraw very good, clean source water from Lake Champlain, remove the particulate matter, uh, make sure it's disinfected, and then pump it up the hill to the rest of the community. Uh, secondarily, 
it also has the benefit of providing fire protection. So the, the levels at which we pump at, the amount of water that we can provide to our hydrants and to fire sprinkler services is what enables the city of Burlington to have good insurance rates because the insurance companies know if there's a fire, there's gonna be sufficient flow to put on that fire and put it out. And I was hoping our fire guys would still be here so they could cheer us on. Um, you know, I've listed, and we actually have copies of the presentation in the back if you wanna take one home. I'm not gonna go through all of our different infrastructure, um, but you know, we have a lot of it. A lot of it's underground, a lot of it is extremely old. We're still looking at 42% of our pipes being older than 75 years, and almost 25% being older than um, 100 years old, and pipes generally are only supposed to last around 75. Moving on to wastewater. Um, Wastewater, we're trying to really call more water recovery. That's what it is. You're, you're taking clean drinking water. You're sometimes adding not so clean things to it. It has to get to the wastewater treatment plant where we then strip out the sewer parts, the black water parts of the, um, of the sewage and also, and also treat the combined sewer flow, which is the stormwater mixed with the wastewater before we discharge it back to the lake, which as you remember is our drinking water source. Uh, we have three wastewater treatment plants. Uh, 25 pump stations, it's also an extensive collection system, which is also very old. Oh, and I just wanna show this, my, my wastewater guys, they often talk, to themsel talk uh, uh, of themselves as bug farmers because this aeration system, that's where all the bacteria live, it's the bacteria that come from soil, it comes from your gut. Those bacteria are really what do the work of treating the wastewater and since I was a stormwater geek, when I became my current role, Steve Roy, my um, mentor was like, you're gonna love wastewater. And it is, it is so fascinating what happens and how the water actually gets cleaned. It baffles my mind every day. Moving on to stormwater, which is sort of the, the baby of the siblings, of the water siblings, right? Because people didn't used to think about stormwater until we started realizing that stormwater actually has a great deal of pollutants. So in 2009, Burlington had the foresight of creating a stormwater utility. It was the second in Vermont. And the stormwater program functions or uh, focuses on two major things, which is reducing the amount of pollutants that's in the stormwater. Even though stormwater looks cleaner than wastewater, over time and the extensive volume, let's think about the Halloween uh, storm 2019, that was an extensive volume of water that was all carrying different pollutants, phosphorus, um, uh, other nutrients, bacteria, oils, and grease. It doesn't, you know, Gallon for gallon, it's not as concentrated as wastewater, but over time, the excessive load also has impacts on the lake. The other thing that our stormwater program works tirelessly to do is reduce the amount of stormwater volume that's going into our combined sewer system. We do still have combined sewer overflows, which is when uh, the stormwater gets into the pipe where the wastewater is, and sometimes it can't fit through the pipe, and there are these relief points. We have five remaining ones, and one in particular is, continues to go off uh, more frequently than the others. Uh, Pine Street Barge Canal, that's the one that went off in the Halloween storm. Um, but those relief points are there so that it doesn't back up onto the roads, it doesn't back up into as many people's basements as it would otherwise. So it is an unfortunate part of our system, but it is there for a reason. I don't like to say it's intentional, but it is as the system has been designed in the past, and it's, some, it's a, a historical legacy that we're dealing with now. <clears throat> Kind of getting back to that stewardship piece, for a long time, in my estimation, we weren't doing such a great job of stewarding our infrastructure. We weren't investing in replacing and repairing our infrastructure, except when it broke. And you can see as of uh, FY17 into 18 into 19 with the support of the mayor and the city council, we've really started to start spending the amounts or close to the amounts that we may need to spend. Um, in FY20, you can see some additional bars. That is the, the um, Clean Water Resiliency Plan, the bond, the stor stormwater and wastewater bond that 92% of voters, which was an awesome number, it was great to get that, that uh, support um, so that we could start fixing our older plant and start fixing some of our existing infrastructure. So, you know, we started off with our water mains in FY17. We're working on um, our elevated tanks. So the elevated tank that is here on the UVM campus, which I know a couple of you had mentioned that project caused more noise than either we or you anticipated, and we can talk about that later. Um, and then we'll be doing the Redstone Tank, which is on the Redstone campus. But we're also underway with designs for replacements of our disinfection system. That was one of the things that failed in 2018 at our wastewater plant. 
Um, the SCADA PLC, which is the computerized controls, it's the brain, um, the, the, the motherboard, if you will, of the, of the plant, which failed. And uh, we're also looking at our pump station and collection systems. We're also doing that on the stormwater side, looking at our existing infrastructure. I want to stress that this effort is primarily about keeping our house, our current house, together. And there is a separate effort going on to figure out all of the new stuff we are going to have to do to meet new regulations to make sure that we're cleaning up the lake. This is really about keeping ourselves from backsliding. Briefly, even though we think of those, those utilities as three separate utilities, we are a one water utility organization. Um, water itself is one water. It doesn't matter. You, know, you can't think about wastewater without thinking about storm water or, or drinking water. And so a, lo a large number of our, our functions, uh, planning, oversight, engineering, billing, administration, are all under one, one roof um, and under one you know, set of leadership. You know, this results in overall cost savings as well as some more holistic thinking. So why do we need to look at our rates? Um, mostly because as I start to look at our budgets in recent years and in future years, I am concerned that A, we need to be taking a hard look at making sure we are uh, collecting enough money so that we can continue this level of reinvestment in our infrastructure. Um, and we have some big budget lines. We have a, a large personnel line. We have debt service that's left over from the 1990s and will be on our books for another, I think, 10 or 15 years. Uh, we have electricity costs, uh, getting rid of our biosolids, um, which is the sludge component, the, the solid component of our wastewater. Those costs are going up every year. And so when I start to look at that, I think, OK, we need to buckle down, do some really amazing detailed financial planning and then really look at what those rates are going to have to do in order to collect that money. So fortunately, this lined up with where the council was at when we had come to them requesting um, some rate increases for some additional staffing. Um, and they specifically directed us to not just do this financial planning, but to look at alternative revenue sources, make sure there aren't things out there that we're not charging for, that we could be charging for, and also to look at alternative rate structures to make sure we were we're uh, protecting that access to that essential quantity of water. I'm not gonna protect somebody who's wasting water, but everybody deserves that sort of initial block that you need for cooking, cleaning, proper sanitation, right? I mean, does everybody agree? I think I heard some claps back there when we were talking about you know, access to clean water. We also wanna make sure that even if we change the rate structure, there may still be folks who are already so burdened by other cost pressures that maybe we need to give them even additional help. Maybe we need to actually be discounting the rate in some way, and so we were directed to look at that. Uh, and then, of course, the city council wanted to make sure, since this is going to impact um, the entire city, all of the rate payers, that we did a lot of uh, um, outreach and engagement. We've had a public meeting, a sort of general public meeting, and now we're do visiting all of the NPAs. <clears throat> So with that, we hired um, Raftelis, which is a uh, consulting firm that their bread and butter is water resources, utilities, and specifically this type of rate work. And we endeavor, we're endeavoring to make sure, A, that we're fully recovering all of our costs. So what are all of the things we need to be collecting money for, and are we getting all of the money that we need to get? Making sure that we're recovering those costs in an equitable, equitable way. Um, right now, and when we look at the rates, you'll see everybody pays the same rate. doesn't matter whether you're a business or whatever. Everybody's paying the same rate. And there are certain folks who are getting different benefits. Um, and so we want to make sure that there may not be a better way to, um, to charge people for that initial block of water and make sure we have that essential access, but then to look at some other rate classes in a different way um, just because... Well, we'll get into that. <laughs> and then lastly, uh, maintaining that affordable service. So changing the rate structure and also looking at affordability programs. Who, who here knows how much they pay for their water bill a month? Sharon, how much do you pay? Do you know? Yeah, about $50. About $50. Anybody else know what they pay? 80 Oh, okay. We have some leak detection kits back there just to make sure that you're not using more water than you need to. So, so Sharon is in the range of a very typical single-family residential customer uh, using about 400 cubic feet a month. Um, when we meter, we charge your wastewater based on how much water you use. It's relatively difficult to meter the wastewater going out, and so we assume, and this is very typical of all utilities, 
that the water you use is what's going out, generally speaking. Now, of course, you're drinking some water and maybe you're using the bathroom elsewhere, but on balance, it generally is the right, right amount. Um, and then for storm water, storm, a storm water fee came about in 2009. If you are a single family, duplex or triplex, you play a, fat, a flat fee, which is based on the average amount of impervious surface, hardened surface um, that is associated with those classes. And everybody else uh, gets assessed. We actually use satellite imagery to measure the amount of impervious and then charge per 1,000 uh, uh, square feet of impervious. So as I said, right now, Everybody pays $4.44 for 100 cubic feet of water. So 10 by 10 room, one foot deep, that's 100 cubic feet of water. It's also 748 gallons. Some of the things we're looking at include looking at the, right now our rate structure doesn't include what they call a standalone fixed charge. A large majority of our costs are fixed. It doesn't matter if, if everybody here in the entire city decided to not use our water system on a given day, my costs would be very much the same because I still have to have my people, I still have to have the pipes, I still have to have access to that water. There's like a readiness to serve um, charge. And so we're looking at whether or not there may be utility in moving some of those fixed costs that are on our expense line into a fixed cost on the, um, on the revenue side. And then there's a number of other charges that we are looking at. The majority of these do not or would not affect any existing customers or residential customers. They're largely um, for folks that are more in the commercial setting um, or people who are building new buildings. The things that will affect, and hopefully in a positive way, uh, residential folks would be looking at a lifeline volumetric rate. So instead of charging everybody the same, no matter what amount of water you're using, potentially we would look at setting an initial block of water, potentially 400 cubic feet, which is that sort of typical usage at a much lower rate. So that if you use the typical amount of water that a residential customer uses, you're actually gonna get a, a, a smaller, um, you're gonna get the same amount of water for a smaller amount of money. Um, the flip side of that, it would be that then if you use more than that, you would be getting charged more for that block of water. It's very similar to what the electricity and I think gas companies do. Um, the other piece would be potentially having different rates depending if you're residential or you're commercial. That's one thing that we're looking at. And then lastly, this low, co low income customer assistance program. We've developed some models and tools so that as we look at the different rates and how they change over time, we can look at that lowest quartile income level, the people who are really below the federal poverty limit who are having trouble making ends meet. And even though we've made those other changes to the rate, if they're still paying a large percentage of their income just for a water bill, how can we discount that? Now, we're not planning on reviewing people's income. We're looking to leverage other programs so that if somebody, for instance, qualifies for three squares, they could show us proof of that, and then they would maybe get some sort of discount on their bill. It might look like a waiver of that fixed charge that we were talking about in, in, in the previous slide. So those are the, some of the things that we're playing with. Um, we're trying really hard to make sure that we are able to work with the city council to pass something this, uh, for this next fiscal year. What I think that means is that there's probably a lot of options on here that we want to see happen in the near term but may not happen immediately. And so some of the things that are on here might get tabled for a future phase. Um, you know, whether it's figuring out if we need to have more leak detection and repair services, more technical assistance. I've talked a lot with um, Sharon about how we might be able to provide assistance for people um, when they're repairing their water service lines or particularly their sewer lateral lines. That can be a huge cost to a residential um, property owner that um, can really set them back. And we don't currently have a way to help with that, except when the water line, we can do a little bit of a payment plan, but on the sewer, we can't. So there's lots of things we can do, and we don't, we don't want people to think that we're going to stop um, with whatever we propose uh, for FY21. So just project schedule, I'm not going to go over it. I'm just going to leave it up here as we get into questions, just to know we're on a pretty tight timeline. We're crunching numbers now. We're, host, we're supposed to come back to the council in February for a work session where we present to them a couple of the alternatives that we're, we're considering. Um, hopefully get some input from them, come back to you guys, right, with some more details about really where we're going. Um, and then in April, try to get some actual decision by the city council as to what rate structure they want to see for FY21. Okay.
Thanks, Megan. So you ready for some questions? Absolutely. Questions, suggestions, whatever. Any questions, comments, opinions? Yeah. Thank you. Um, two questions. One, I you know live in this area and walk a lot, and many, many of our storm grates, especially right now, are covered and clogged. So, and I know that there was one person who wrote to the MP, you know, to Chapin and in the MPA, you know, what did they call it, Front Porch Forum about, in Seattle, they clean their streets twice a week. Not, excuse me, not twice a week, every two weeks. They have the street sweepers to clean the grates to keep their water clean. So I've said this before, DPW, and I'm just wondering, one, since you know you showed that picture, why don't we do a better job at keeping our grades clear so they can do the job? And then my other thing, which you know me well about, is that with zoning, we do not enforce lot coverage, mm -hmm. and we do not um, keep grass so we have permeable space. We've got, you know, even our green belt. We own that city green belt. So much of our green belt is not permeable. So. To me, that is a huge loss of soil. I mean, I see the difference in living here for 40 years of the water running down Henry Street. So to me, that is a loss, just a lost thing that we should be doing with our, and that's the zoning office, I know that. Right. Code enforcement. So your first question on the, the cleaning, I, that kind of falls into the stewardship category, and right now, we don't have the staff or the resources to clean in the way that other communities do. Um, it's something that I and Jenna will certainly be working with DPW on because um, street sweeping has many benefits, not just providing a cleaner, more aesthetically pleasing, better for bicycles, but uh, leaves are phosphorus. And so there are communities in which they've shown um, a more frequent leaf sweeping or street sweeping program um, could really have great benefits on the phosphorus side. Um, it gets into the sacred parking because in order to do that, in some of the lanes that have the most leaves, we would have to post parking. We would we would end up being like other urban cities where on the you know certain you know first and third Monday of every month you just don't park on that side. So it's going to be a huge undertaking and trying to wrangle the parking beast is going to be painful. But um, I think it's important. And you know I agree with you on the need to maintain pervious surfaces as pervious. It is a zoning issue. Um, I, th I think it's something we still, we're, we're interested in trying to figure out. We just don't know really the best way to go about it from the water resources perspective, even though we wholeheartedly agree. So keep up, keep up the pictures, because you know they do tell a thousand words. A couple more questions. Go ahead. Um, just, uh, is this on? Um, Sounds like it. So. When there's new development that's proposed in Burlington, do we have limited capability or unlimited capability to take on new development? I'm, I'm very familiar with development where you don't have town water and town sewer. And I know a number of bedrooms, I mean, there's a, we have to go and ask first, is there capability you know, in yep. the soils? So do we have capability in our town, our city, to, I mean, what is the limitation of what we currently have? Or do you not get asked that question when there is development that's so, proposed? So, it's a great question. Um, anytime new development comes, they do have to come to our office and get a capacity letter to verify that we, in fact, have capacity to serve on the water side and capacity to serve on the sewer side. While our plant gets stressed during storm events, main plant, the one that's down on the waterfront, um, from a dry weather, from an actual sewage pr processing capacity, it still has a million of its 5.2 million gallons available. So we aren't having trouble with the willing or the ability to serve the sewer component. What we've been doing though is leveraging those new developments like Cambrian Rise, as city or um, city place, whatever it looks like. Um, when those come through, we are making them take off even more storm water than our regulations would other require. So any developments, even if it wasn't increasing its wastewater, if it was increasing its impervious surface or redeveloping impervious surface, it actually has to make things better at the end of the day, almost like a regenerative development concept. But those ones that are really adding a lot of wastewater actually have to go above and beyond and either take off more storm water from their site or they work with us 
to find a project or pay us so that we can take off more water, so that we're constantly trying to regain some of the available capacity in the pipe. Does that answer your question? It's something we have to keep our eye on on the wastewater side, but we're not to the point of getting to like, oh no, we can't have any more and we need to build a bigger plant. Right? Okay. So we have at least three more questions, okay. and, uh, but we have a limited amount of time. I'll answer in haiku only. Excellent. <laughs> and uh, also I've been asked to, to, to point out yes. that there's some uh, poster boards back here that have uh, a lot of information, so please take advantage of that. We so will stay here until the last question, so we'll stay here until 11. If you guys want to talk water all night, we're your, we're your gals, so Wow, yes. that's a commitment. Okay, go ahead, Jack. <laughs> all right, thank you all. Um, Really continue to be really just impressed by the amazing work that you all do over there. Um, and I'm just curious a little bit more about the rate structure um, in terms of, so making it cheaper for the initial kind of uh, essential services or the normal amount that folks would need. And then can you talk a little bit more about where we would then make up that revenue? So I think one thing that comes to mind is like kind of the more luxury uses. Can we go yep. much higher on that? And also new development, is that an opportunity to bring in additional revenue? Does that help us on the revenue side? And also just maybe really quickly, if you can, speaking to the issue of like, especially for a new multifamily, like the metering issue in terms of breaking it out by unit and things like that. Okay. That's a lot, but I will try. So um, yes, if we make it cheaper for that initial block, we have to regain the money somewhere else. Our first turn of the wheel is going to make is going to see a can we get more efficient with any of our costs? We are doing an efficiency sort of analysis, and or can we provide more services for the same cost? Um, but then one of the other things is looking at all these other fees because that could create that could create the initial nugget that would offset the decrease in revenue from that initial block of residential. Um, to the extent that it doesn't, it does, it does mean that somebody else is gonna have to pay more. So between the folks who use a lot of water um, in that next tier or a commercial property, the thought being that a commercial property, um, if, their, if their water increases, it's not affecting their ability to live, they will have to account for that in their cost of their goods. Um, it's gonna be a fine line and that's kind of what we're gonna have to work on with the council is how much do we do the teeter-totter. Uh, as far as new development, there are a couple of things on here that would help. So connection charge, right now we do a lot of review of new developments and we don't necessarily charge for all of my staff time, all of the engineering time. The other one, which we could, we used to have a sort of capital recovery charge, not really an impact fee, but a, a system buy-in fee. So you all have been paying for the infrastructure and the debt service, and there's a way of sort of when a new person comes along, having them buy in to all of the other investments, the equity that has been built up. Um, the last part, I think the meter one we'll probably need to talk about with Jess. It, it is complicated. I think he's talking about the fact that multi-unit buildings often have only one water meter, whereas they have multiple electrical meters, and so it is a little hard if you live in that type of building to be in control of your own water usage because your neighbor could be guzzling water and causing your entire building to use a lot of water. I think that's what you're getting at, and there isn't really a good answer yet. So, so in the back. You don't need a, oh, okay. I thought it was a, <coughs> I thought there was a switch. Um, hi, Megan. Uh, Kai Forley. I'm founder of yep. Waterwise Vermont, and I just have a couple comments or questions, I should say. Um, first is you kind of zipped right over the slide that referred to the uh, city's biosolids. Yep. Uh, uh, not program, but but what we produce. Um, Ten thousand tons. Yep. And. In, in your analysis um, of future revenues, expenses, whatnot, um, how much have you looked at potential exposure uh, on the part of the city and I guess on the part of your department um, to um, potential land contamination by land applying that sludge? Currently it's sent to a small community in New York State and spread on farmland. And obviously there's a big issue in, nearby in Maine with, uh, with PFAS and sewage sludge and land that's permanently contaminated now and farms and whatnot. So that's my first question, because um, that's obviously a huge potential expense that you'd want to budget for if you could. Uh, and then I was on a part of a webinar this morning that took place um, okay. with uh, the Rich Earth Institute down in Brattleboro. Mm -hmm. um, there were lots of... Uh, commissioners and and uh, folks from 
agency of natural resources and DECs from other states um, and local officials and whatnot. That program or that that webinar was all about um, diverting urine mm -hmm. and using it as a fertilizer. And unfortunately, I was the only person from Vermont uh, that took part in that webinar. There were no state officials, no city officials, etc. Mm -hmm. So, what is the since I see a lot of this um, expenditure. Um, I view it as putting good money towards a bad use. Uh, uh, our legacy systems, I view a lot of it as ineffective and not resilient. Um, wastewater treatment plants are the, the largest, typically the largest electricity use, use uh, or user in a city mm -hmm. municipal portfolio. portfolio and uh, given what's coming down the path with fossil, um, you know, f uh, fossil fuel exhaustion and climate change, and whatnot. These are potentially uh, systems that will not be resilient in the future. And uh, what is the city doing to examine alternatives and specifically things like uh, urine recovery, dry toilets, um, rainwater harvesting, storage, and on-site gray water? So that all great questions. Um, the PFAS issue, I believe is what you're referring to with sludge. PFAS has been around for ages. We now are have lower detection limits, and so we're finding it in more and more things. It's found in people's blood. It's in so many different things. Wastewater is in the unfortunate position of being a receiving station. It's not that we are creating the PFOS, but the PFOS has come down the pipe to us, and so the sludge that uh, the, the sludge that wastewater produces does have some amount of this industrial um, contaminant, and it is very concerning. We already pay $960,000 a year to dispose of whether it's in the landfill or Chateaugay, New York, and so it is, it is chief on my mind. Some of the other questions you're talking about, it's, it's really hard because you are talking about some major sy systemic, systematic change that needs to happen. It's almost like when we get into conversations about low-income people or mental health, it's such a bigger issue, um, and I'm not, I haven't figured out how some of those conversations could happen and, and whether or not we're the only ones at the table. I don't, I don't know if I see the wastewater utility being able to systematically figure out how to make people go to urine diversion or dry toilets. Um, I know that there may, be need to be, there may need to be, there needs to be a change in the future and right now, literally, I'm trying to make sure that my existing system works and works to the best of its ability so that it's not you know, dealing with some of the other pollutants. So I would be happy to talk to you more after this. Um, it, it, they're a huge problem and I, I don't have the answer to it. It's not something that we're ignoring. It's more that I don't even have the bandwidth to figure out some of those things. Um, and I think they're bigger conversations about our entire systems, um, so. So um, one, more, one more question. Um, I, I own some apartment buildings and I have a, a large property at 18 units that has a single water meter. Mm -hmm. So nobody owns the, the responsibility for the water but, but me, yep. right? When I had the electrical redone on that property, Burlington Electric would not let me put in a single electric meter. Okay. Their reason was that it takes away the buy-in from the tenant mm -hmm. and they'll misuse it. So the AC stays on all the time and so on. I have other townhomes down on Hyde Street that are all individually water metered and those people are calling me asking me for water restrictive <laughs> for uh, the, uh, the uh, aerators for the faucets and the showers and how else can I help them save money and everything else. Do you, do you see the future being where you start making people responsible for their own water to where, you know, 60% of the tenants in Berlin, I'm sorry, 60% of the residents Property, in Burlington yes. rent, Yep. right? And I would imagine many of them do not see a water bill. Right, it, so, and Jess can answer that question, but the, the property owner can put the um, bill in the tenant's name. That doesn't get to your question of, correct? So there is a tenant agreement form in which you can actually, certain properties. Right, it doesn't, it doesn't work. I, we'd have to look at your specific building. A lot of the buildings are not built in a way where e you'd be able to, like, right, the internal plumbing. Even if we gave you all the meters in the world, unless you have separate pipes going to all the separate apartments, it wouldn't work that way. I, I have to look back in history as to why it was like that. Um, but, 
Right. I think, I mean, so I'm going to kind of um, cut us off here because you can, um, I'd encourage you, you're going to be here till 11 o'clock tonight. 11, so, tonight, whatever. Um, you can have a more extended conversation yep. with folks as, and we really appreciate that commitment. It's for, like, talk about public service. I mean, really a few snacks it. left, right? Okay. So, yeah. so um, you guys brought the cots, right? The sleeping, okay. <laughs> okay, and, and again, encourage you to, to take a look at the posters out here. We have a few minutes left for the uh, city councilors updates. So I want to switch to that. And Jack, you want to lead off because you've got the microphone? Uh, yeah, sure, I can lead off. Um, there's a lot going on right now, definitely. Uh, I would say one of the big issues that's on the front of my mind is around the Amtrak stop coming, returning to Burlington um, and associated imp potential impacts of that around uh, the need for potentially a second uh, track at the bottom of Main Street, so between, basically between College and King, King or Maple around there, um, having a second track to be used for storage and overnighting of the trains and servicing, um, and or potentially be used um, by Vermont Rail Systems for some of their freight operations. That's where it gets a little muddy is you know, who, who really wants the second track and what exactly would it be used for. But um, we're going to have a meeting where VTrans, who ultimately is the decision maker on this, um, VTrans is coming to the Transportation Energy and Utilities Committee on Tuesday night um, at 6.30. So if you want to learn more about that and get to ask questions of VTrans, I, I have a lot of questions. So. Um, I got to pull up the location. I'll pull it up while, while they're talking. Um, so yeah, that, that's Tuesday night at 6.30. I'll get you the location. Um, BPD. Burlington Police Department. Thanks. Um, so that'll be, yeah, that'll be Tuesday night. And this is really our first chance to get VTrans in the room and actually ask them what's going on. It's very confusing, honestly, and complicated. So this, this will hopefully give us a lot more clarity. Um, just before this, I came from a meeting about the Winooski Avenue corridor. It's not really in wards one and eight, but I think it affects all of us. I think we all use that corridor for some time or another, and um, there's a proposal to potentially add bike lanes along the entirety of it in both directions. So I've been getting pretty involved and engaged in that and trying to push that forward. Um, trying to think of other issues. I've been getting engaged in these folks' uh, committee in terms of the joint committee with ordinance um, and planning and zoning around changes to minimum parking requirements. Are you all going to speak to that at all, or should I speak to it at all? All right, so that's, that's something I've been getting involved with as well, around, and this came out of the housing summit. Um, it was one of the initiatives, but essentially for new developments in downtown and along bus routes, uh, we're looking at eliminating the minimum parking requirements. So. That's not saying no one's going to build parking, but it's saying we're not going to mandate a certain level of parking. And the additional component of it that we're now looking at and that I've been really advocating for is getting developers to um, also implement transportation demand management uh, mechanisms. So kind of like what UVM does with the free bus passes for affiliates, um, you know, charging for parking, um, offering discounts and things like car share or bike share programs. So really doing a lot of things to help shift folks' behavior in terms of how they get to and from that development or that space. Um, so yeah, those are, I think, three things that are really critical to the future of transportation in Burlington. And for me, that's really a top priority given that transportation is the biggest um, source of emissions in Vermont and continues to increase. Um, so I think we really need to crack that knot if we're going to get serious about the climate crisis. and. Vermont's emissions continue to go up, and I just saw uh, a couple articles about how all of our neighbors have reduced their emissions since 1990. So New York, New Hampshire, Massachusetts, and Quebec have all reduced emissions. We're up 16%, and it's largely due to transportation. So this is really serious. We need to go all in in terms of uh, 
changing that system. And I think all of three of these issues that I just mentioned are big opportunities to, to drive that forward. Um, I'll just leave it at that for now. Thanks. Uh, the, can you hear me? The other items related to uh, the ordinance work that uh, Council Bush and I sit on that committee and, and many others have been participating, which has been great. Um, beyond parking minimums, we're also looking at uh, ADUs, accessory dwelling units, as well as uh, how to regulate short-term rentals, mostly Airbnb, but there are some others as well. Um, and so that, that process is moving along. We are, we are getting a lot of that work done. And so if you, ha you are interested in, in these sorts of topics, uh, let any of us know or come to the meetings and, and engage now or else in a couple of weeks you know how it goes it'll be uh, a lot of the work will be done and, and you'll be working from behind so um, we're, we're well on our way making progress on those so reach out if you're interested in those topics I'll, I'll use the rest of my time um, I'm not gonna go on too much here but I, I, I do want to point out that uh, it's cold not like anyone hasn't noticed but um, the the warming shelter which is which is down downtown uh, the low barrier homeless warming shelter uh, it has a new operator for those that don't know uh, chcb community health centers of burlington operated it for three years really successfully uh, but what was not able to operate it for this year and uh, I, I was involved with with a few others in in bringing a new a new agency on to to run it in a new place and they've been they're up and running and they're doing great but there there are some growing pains and i i talked with them today and uh one of the issues that that they have is uh the the nightly meals that they serve there uh they have gaps throughout the next couple of months and in thinking through solutions with them uh, a thing that would really benefit their cause and help a lot of people on a night-to-night -night basis um, is doing a soup drive so soup that is frozen that can be stored and pulled out to, to feed folks uh, in, the, in the dead of winter as they're staying there uh, is a big need that they have. Uh, you heard from students earlier that they're working on getting toiletries and other needs together, and that's another need that, that's being worked on. So what I'd like to ask uh, folks here and folks who will be watching is uh, to go to the, the Warming Shelter website. I think it's btvwarmingshelter.org. If you Google it, it'll find it for you. Uh, and they have a, a page there where you're able to, to contribute to this, um, either for the kind of the, the sundry side, the, the toiletries, or for this meal uh, operation. So even just a couple of gallons of soup that can be brought down, uh, you can go through that website or reach out to me, and I'd love to get their stockpiles filled so that they don't need to be worried about providing meals for folks on a nightly basis. Um, I'll also be working, and I might bring something to the council on Monday, uh, to promote this a little bit more to get restaurants locally involved who can make soup at a greater scale than you, Councillor Busher. Um, <laughs> I'll also be working with churches now with, <laughs> upon advice from Councillor Busher. Uh, but no, to just get more people involved. And so go to the website if you can do a little bit or if you know a restaurateur or a church that can help with this. Uh, this would be a, a really great thing to do during the giving season. So I just want to promote that. Thanks. Thank you, Adam, for that. Um, so um, I'm going to talk about other things. Um, so tonight, the CDNR committee, which is the Community Development Neighborhood Revitalization Committee, had a meeting. Um, and it was supposed to be from 5.30 to 7.30, but because of the Winooski Avenue corridor, they changed the time. But the topic for tonight was the Brookfield was coming, the developer was coming, and um, the topic was how was the developer going to engage with the community um, with the amended development of City Place. And so um, what I had wanted to say, um, I did in, via email, was that um, there was a plan that was referenced at the City Council meeting that they would come to all the NPAs, which is fine. But I think, it, I think it's good for our community to also hear each other. I'd like to know what the people in Ward 4 and 7 think as far as Wards um, 5 and 6 and 1 and 8 and 2 and 3. So I had said, um, and I had talked to the mayor that we should have at least two 
public meetings that would be in Contois where people, the businesses downtown, people from any section of the city could come, see the proposed amended plan and give some input and get questions answered. Um, so that was the only topic for tonight. I know they are going to also talk about um, the neighborhood project, which obviously is near and dear to our hearts, but that's not going to happen. Uh, that was not going to be on the agenda for tonight. The second thing that the city has, the city council has been immersed in, is the sale of Burlington Telecom and the monies that we have um, received as a result of that. It's going to be between six and seven million dollars. Now, some of that money has to go to certain things with retirement. There are certain requirements that we. There really is no debate about giving about oh, maybe one point one one and a half million dollars or so to um, infrastructure and retirement uh, responsibilities or obligations. Um, but that leaves the remainder of the money available. Um, there is, what I understand, is agreement that we would like to have a seat on the board. And to do that, we have to buy a certain share, 7.5%, which is about $2.4 million. So then that leaves the residual money uh, for other things that we either could invest in BT um, and hope that there would be a return and pay ourselves back for some of the $16.9 million that we lent and didn't get back, or there are other ideas out there. What um, The City Council had one meeting on November 4th, and now on this coming Monday there'll be another meeting and discussion about how we're going to use those funds. I just want to make sure that everybody in the ward knows about this. I would very much appreciate having some guidance from all of you, and I can't give you any more feedback right here, but I'm more than willing to have a conversation with you in more depth um, because I really need your guidance. This is an important decision, um, and I want to really reflect what you think. The last thing I wanted to say, um, was that the BED um, presentation tonight, one thing I did put forward, I worked with Darren um, and uh, Jennifer Green regarding um, new development and to require that new development, if at all possible, would have electric heat um, and do those heat pumps that was being referenced. And so, um, I wanted to do significant rehab also, but the bottom line is that that is very complicated, as I learned, and we couldn't bite that off at this time. And then the, obviously, as Karen and, and Sandy referenced, what are all of us going to do who have gas heat and need to try to make that conversion? Um, that's another topic. But um, I am thinking about what we can do to address some of the needs that we have, um, and I just wanted you all to know that that's the first step. Um, and I'll end now because I see Cindy looking at me. <laughs> thank you. So, um, thank you, Councillors. And um, I'd ask that if you, uh, it's possible for you to stick around to, to answer questions informally um, if you, for a few minutes, that would be great. But I know it's, it's a little bit after nine, and uh, I've been encur strongly encouraged a number of times to try to wrap up at nine so that people that need to get home can get home. A couple quick I things. I usually drive, so, but I did because where, what time does that garage thing go down? I don't know. 10? 10? Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay, so, you, so you're safe. <laughs> you won't have to spend the night, it looks like, okay. unless you stick around with the, uh, uh, the stormwater folks who are going to be here until God only knows when. So a couple quick things. If you didn't sign in, if you would sign in as you go out, that would be great. So we have a sense of who is here. And if you're interested in the housing conversation, I would love to have a few people to, uh, to help with shaping that. So please sign up. There's a sign-up sheet there. And anything else before we wrap up? So... Great, thank you everyone for a great meeting and appreciate it and we'll see you in December. And it's likely that we'll have uh, uh, kind of a, more like a full meal uh, in December. Is that, is that what we're thinking? Possibly. So stay tuned on Front Porch Forum because uh, uh, we're thinking about having, you know, putting on the dog a little bit in December. Yeah, okay. <laughs>